I want to start real quick by taking a selfie with you guys, if that's all right. All right, so everyone smile big. Yeah, lots of woohoos, lots of woohoos. All right, one, two, three. Thank you. Now everyone put your phones away. Um, so I've had an absolutely phenomenal day. Uh, have you? Yes. I think um, this is probably one of the most meaningful um, groupings of people doing important work that I've ever been a part of. Uh, so thank you for giving me the opportunity to be here. Um, if you haven't noticed, uh, I'm not a woman. Um, hopefully you have. But I felt um, completely honored to have been asked to be a part of this. Uh, back in October when I was just launching my business, I was asked by Nicole and Edith and the folks at Surprise to help launch uh, Surprise's Women Leading Government Initiative. And as we started working and developed the groups and the initiatives, um, I realized how important this work truly is. I was raised by a single mom who uh, showed me how powerful a woman can be. Uh, at the age of 40, she decided to take herself back to dental school. Uh, single mom, two boys, going to dental school with kids half her age, literally half her age, and thriving. Um, so being here and being a part of uh, activating all of the work that's happening, uh, thank you for letting me be a part of this. Thank you. No, clap for you, not for me. Um, so I, I want to finish off uh, with, some, with some really interesting, you know, I like to do brain science stuff. So interesting brain science. So first of all, does anyone know who this adorable baby is? This is Franklin Delano Roosevelt. This adorable world leader is Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Now, here's the thing. Back in the late 1800s, this was normal dress attire for little boys. Right? Normal dress attire for little boys. But then something changed. Now, we have all these ideas of what gender stereotypes are, what gender roles are, understandings of gender are, but sometimes they change, right? Sometimes they change. Now, if you think about what you learned today, what Nicole and I talked to you about, what, what Carol talked about, what all the different breakout groups talked about, Dr. Maria talked about, can you think of anything that could change? Can you think of anything that could stand a change. Can you think of anything that can change? Um, I was listening to a podcast probably two years ago, uh, and it's economics, I'm a geek, economics pod podcast, and it talked about Japan. And Japan has been struggling economically for a while, and all of these big name thinker, eco economists said, the one thing Japan needs to do to completely turn around their economy is let their women work. That's the one thing they need to do that will completely turn around their economy because they have very strict gender roles there. Now, I can, I can say this, I am a quarter Japanese, so I'm not like hating on Japanese folks. I am a Japanese folk. Um, but think about that. Think about that. The power isn't just getting more people in the workforce, it's about diversity of thought. The reasoning to have a balance here, is, as Nikki said, Nicole said earlier, is representation, right? There aren't 13% women in your communities. It's usually around, I think, uh, nationwide, it's about 51, 52% female. We want better diversity of thought. Some things can change. So, speaking of change, I'd like to introduce you to a new numbering system. Now, I've talked with each of your HR departments, and you're going to be paid with this new number system, but you have to enter in a PIN to get your new paycheck. All right? So it's very imperative that you learn this new number system. If you don't learn it, you won't get paid. 
Okay, and, and, and I talked to the IT folks. They said, it, this is, this is going to happen. It's going to roll out in about five minutes. Okay, so I'm going to introduce you to the new number system here in a minute. This is, a, this is fake. I haven't talked to anybody. Okay. <laughs> but we're going to roll out this new number system in, in about five minutes. And so what I'd like you to do is learn the new number system. Do not take out your cell phones. Learn the new number system. Oh, wait, what's that? It just went live. Sorry, you know, sometimes these things go faster. Okay, so to get your next paycheck, what I'd like you to do is enter in your code or write down your, your new PIN, and the new PIN is 1258. So go ahead and get out your journals, your pads, write out your new, your new PIN, 1258, in the new number system. I notice a lot of people not writing. <laughs> why not? Someone, someone shout out, why, why aren't you writing? Can't do it. And what else? I didn't memorize it. I don't have time. It doesn't make any sense. This thing is fake anyway. <laughs> now, did anyone write? Who, who wrote something down? Did you write the old number system down? This is how we naturally respond to change. When we are introduced to a new thing, a new number system, we revert right back to the old way. We write our Arabic numerals, that's what they're called, Arabic numerals, one, two, five, eight, and then try to translate those. When we try to learn a language as adults, what do we do? This word means that word. We try to translate, we go back to what we already know to help teach us what we don't know. That's not how change works. If you think about when you learned a language, you didn't learn this word means that word as a baby. No, you mean that thing means this word. This word means that thing. So we're going through change. Think about that. Do, are we reverting back to our old ways? Because that's our natural reaction. Are we completely resisting? I'm not going to write anything down. You're just a consultant. You're going to come in and leave in a minute. Like, I, don't, I, don't I can wait it out. <laughs> I've heard that before. Right? And some people are laughing, like, I do that all the time. <laughs> That's how we respond to change. Now, what you've been introduced to today is an opportunity for change. And what you're going to do is you're going to go back to work. You're going to go back to your old context, your old desk, your old coworkers. And something may have changed in you today. And if you go back to the old way of thinking, what was the point of today? Okay, now, I'm going to shift gears a little bit. I'm going to show you something that is going to help you understand this new number system. It'll take you about two seconds, and you'll memorize it for the rest of your life. Who thinks that's impossible? It's possible. Ready? Oh. That sound you just collectively made? That is your brain relaxing because of understanding. When you completely understand something, your brain can literally relax. I don't have to memorize all these random different shapes. I can get that whole thing. I understand it. Our brains relax with understanding. Our brains relax with understanding. So think about it. As you're going to try to tell people this new thing you learned, this new paradigm shift that you've had, if you can help them understand it, they'll relax. Their brains will relax and they can settle right into the new. Okay. Now, we're talking about change. We're talking about new ideas. I want to talk to you guys about conscious competence. Conscious competence. Some of you have worked with me before. You've heard this before. So if you think about consciousness or awareness, on one side of it, we have things you know on the other side, you have things you don't know. So things you're aware of, things you're unaware of. Okay? Now, on the up and down axis, we have competence. Things at the bottom you're not good at, or you don't know. And things at the top you're skilled at, you're good at, you know them. Now that gives us a nice little matrix. In the top, top right corner, you don't know that you're good at something. You're unconsciously competent at it. Don't know that you know. So think about driving down the freeway. You don't really have to think about driving. You're just so good at it, you can do it automatically. There's sometimes where you're driving and you kind of zone out for a while. Like, How did I get here? 
Oops. Still alive. So good. <laughs> All right? You're unconsciously competent at driving. Now, the second one over, here's another driving example. Things that you know that you know. You're aware of. You're conscious that you're good at them. You have to think about them. Like parallel parking. We know how to do it, technically. I may not be really good at it, but I know... Okay, just to be clear, I'm from Washington State, and in Washington, you have to do parallel parking on your drive test. I guess you don't have to do that in Arizona. So some people... Who, who cannot at all parallel park? That's crazy. Like, that was like the thing. You had to practice 100 times before you took your driver's test. If you messed it up... Anyway. So, and some people have those cars that just do it for themselves. So... You know that you know. You're consciously aware. You have to think about being good at this thing. All right? Now, coming down, there's things that you know that you don't know. I am aware that I'm unskilled at this thing. I'm aware that I'm unskilled at this thing. Let's say rocket science. Any, any, test, uh, any uh, SpaceX fans in here? Woohoo! Okay, a couple geeks. I love it. So these guys are amazing. Look it up. They can land rockets on, on barges that are remote control. It's crazy. Okay, so I'm aware that I'm unskilled at rocket science. I know that's not something I'm good at. All right? Now, the fourth box, this is the fun one. This is what you don't know that you don't know. You're unaware that you're unskilled at it. You're bad at it, and you don't even know that you're bad at it. <laughs> All right? Now, I don't, have a, I don't have a picture for this because there's nothing that I'm unaware that I'm unskilled at. <laughs> and that's how it manifests. That's how it manifests. So let's say someone says to me, Eric, did you know you'd spit when you talk? No, I don't. I'm just very expressive with my voice. Right? When, we, when someone points out that we're here, we project that we're here. We project, no, no, no I'm actually... Conscious, I'm actually really good at this, and I'm aware that I'm good at this other thing. Or we get defensive, and we push away from it. Okay? So the goal of any education is to get from box four to box three, box three to box two, and box two to box one. That's the goal. That's the goal. And the way we get from four to three is from someone giving us some kind of awareness. Like guilt. Right? We now have this awareness. Right? And then... From box three to box two, practice, training, learning a new skill. And then from box two to box one, perfect practice. That's the goal, is to get from here all the way to there. That's the goal. Now, the hardest step is obviously box four to box three. Because who gets in the way? Ego. Our ego says, I'm not bad at anything. I'm actually good at everything. As our ego says. And when our ego gets in the way, we lose the ability to learn new things. So, hopefully today, you've come out of box four into box three about guilt. About your professional investments. About... Um, cannibalization, right? Hopefully you've learned something new. You've come out of box four into box three, and then you can start practicing this stuff tomorrow if you don't have Fridays off, right? You can come up there and just start working on it right away. That's the goal. That's the goal. Now, there are some dangers. There are some very inherent dangers of moving from box to box to box. And there's one in particular that a lot of people don't know about, and it's a psychological phenomenon called stereotype threat. Write this one down, it's gonna be it's powerful for you. Stereotype threat is when you become hyper aware that someone else has a stereotype about you, you become insecure and manifest out that stereotype. Right? Yes, I'll repeat it. You become aware that someone has a stereotype about you. So, mostly women in this room. What stereotypes are there about women? Shout them out. I'm not going to say it. Yes. They, <laughs> Pam said they can't parallel park. I didn't say it. 
right? So, so we're aware of stereotypes. We walk into a space with a lot of people and we become aware that they're stereotyping us or we're perceiving that they're stereotyping us. And then through our insecurity, we start to manifest that stereotype right back out at them. Now, there's a story about, anyone know who this is? This is Annie Duke. Anyone heard her name? What does she do? Poker. She's the first woman to win the World Series of Poker. Go Annie Duke. So Annie Duke was at the World Series of Poker Tournament of Champions. All the champions are all together playing poker against each other. A hundred people, four women. And Annie Duke got caught in stereotype threat. Because the buzz around is that women don't belong here. Women can't play poker. Women make stupid decisions. And so what did she do? She made stupid decisions because she was so caught up in that stereotype. And she took a break and she got calm. And then she realized something really important. Stereoth stereotype threat isn't the end all be all because there's something else, something else called stereotype tax. And this is when you become aware of other people's stereotypes towards you and use them against them. So Annie Duke realized that all of these guys around her at the table, they were all treating her in different ways, all stereotyping her in different ways. And she said, okay, you think I don't bluff? I'm gonna bluff you. You think I only play this way? I'll play that way. She won. And there's, there's a video of Phil Helmuth, who's the, the guy who wins all of them, and she beat him hand after hand after hand and knocked him out of the tournament to win. He was literally muttering to himself, walking through the hallways. He could not comprehend how she beat him because she used his stereotype against him. So because all of those words that you said, all of those stereotypes, those are not weapons against you. Those could be weapons for you. All right? So there's this idea called growth mindset. Uh, when you're introduced to something that you cannot do, you cannot do it yet. When there's something that you cannot accomplish, you cannot accomplish it yet. Because of the growth mindset, anything's possible. You just can't do it yet. Now, any parents in the room, this is a great thing to introduce to your children because they'll get frustrated with something and say, I can't do it. I say, well, you can't do it yet. Because it makes them think about, okay, there's another possibility. There's some future state where I may be able to do that. And leaping open that possibility, all of a sudden, we're more capable, even in failure. So growth mindset, really powerful. Now, I want to share with you guys a video uh, that talks about culture in a very interesting way. And if, if you've been with me, you've seen it before, just enjoy it. Don't spoil it for everybody else, okay? We set up a hidden camera experiment to see if this woman would stand up at the sound of this tone simply because everyone else is. You might be thinking you'd never go along with this, or would you? After just three beeps, and without knowing why she's doing it, this woman is now conforming perfectly to the group. But what happens if we take the group away? Elaine, please. Okay, now she's alone, the crowd is gone, and nobody is watching her, except our hidden cameras. What do you think she'll do? All right, who thinks she's gonna stand up? Raise your hand. Who thinks she's not gonna stand up? Raise your hand. Let's see.
She's now conforming to the rules of the group without them even being there. Now, watch what happens when we introduce another outsider who doesn't know the rules. Have a seat and they'll be out in just a couple minutes. Great, thanks. thanks so much. Think she'll teach the new guy what to do? We kept the cameras rolling as more unsuspecting patients arrived. And slowly but surely, what began as a random rule for this woman has now become the social norm for everyone in this waiting room. Here to explain what's going on in their brains is Jonah Berger of the University of Pennsylvania. This sort of internalized form of herd behavior is part of what we call social learning. Starting at a very early age, when we see members of our group perform a task, our brains literally reward us for following in their footsteps. When I saw everybody stand up, I felt like I needed to join them. Otherwise, I'm like excluded. Once I decided to go with it, then I felt much more comfortable. Conformity is how we become socialized, but it can also cause us to develop bad habits or repeat past wrongs. And it's why even this rebel, who wasn't standing for any of this nonsense, eventually joined the ranks. And the only thing more shocking than seeing how easily conformity affects the way you act is that similar forces are subconsciously shaping the way you think right now. So, holy smokes, right? Um, this, that's, that's a really powerful video, and it, and it perfectly describes how cultures are built. You know, there's sometimes we get to a new job, and we're like, why does everyone do it that way? I don't know. Right, and we just, we just jump in, because being a part of the crowd is easier on our brains. What, she, what did she say? As soon as I stood up, I felt more comfortable. I did something ridiculous, and I felt more comfortable. Right? Now, I'm going to flip that a little bit because what we have the opportunity to do is create a culture, is we can help people feel more comfortable by joining in the women leading government movement, moving the needle from 13% up, not cannibalizing other women, helping people out of their shame spirals and guilt tornadoes, being mindful of the words we use when we ask ourselves questions. That's a movement, that's a culture that I think we can build right now. And it's gonna take us being intentional tomorrow, tonight, maybe with our families, to do something new and better. Because you think about the way things were aren't necessarily the way things are right now, are not necessarily the way things are going to be in the future. If we want to start a movement, it takes nobody but us to start a movement. All right. Um, last year, I think at Women Leading Government, there were about 250 or so folks. Today, over 350. Next year, who knows? Why not 1,000? Why not? Why not? Remember, as we are liberated from our own fear, our presence automatically liberates others. We have an opportunity, we have an obligation to change this paradigm. Women leading government. Thank you.